So what an absolute pleasure it is to have Francois Robert with us today. Francois has had an impressive career in both research and exploration. He's published numerous papers, served on many committees and a multi-award winner. So I am just so excited that he has joined us today to share his wisdom with us on Carl and Gold Deposits of Nevada. So let's have some fun. It's gonna be a great session. I hope you all enjoy it. Please use the chat. You'll have the chance to jump off mute and we'll open up the floor at the end. And yes, thank you so, so much, Francois, for saying yes. It's um, just wonderful having you. My pleasure. And let's see if we're still smiling at the end of this talk. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for the invitation, Jessica. Uh, this is quite a, so far, an interesting experience. And thanks for people to, to join. Uh, after some discussion with Jessica, we uh, decided to settle on a talk on Carlin deposits. Uh, sort of a general overview. We thought this would be something different for you guys down uh, in Australia. So what I thought we'd do is just, just put uh, Carlin deposits in a bit of a context first, and then we'll look at what's, what are some of their distinguishing characteristics in terms of ore uh, and, and architecture of deposits. And then we'll look at their settings and controls. And as I move through this from regional to local, I'll emphasize what I think are the aspects of these deposits that are important from a ore control point of view and from a exploration point of view. And we'll just wrap this up at the end um, in the Great Basin Southwest US context. And th this is a view here of the Gold Strike Pit um, about eight, eight or so years ago. And just uh, that, that monster truck there in the shovel uh, or down the pit. This would be on par with the Femiston pit in Kalgoorlie, just for scale and reference. This is a big monster. But if you look at Carlin deposits globally, they're not that important. It's actually a, a rather small deposits of deposits, small population of deposits that are called Carlin style Carlin type, so as a family. And this is a map here that shows the distribution of deposits that have been called Carlin or part of the Carlin family. They're pretty scattered around and they only account for about 300 million ounces of gold, which is not much compared to uh, porphyry copper systems, copper gold deposits, or compared to orogenic deposits, which you guys have a lot of uh, in Australia. So it's, it's a small population, not that much gold, but you'll see later in the next slide, I think, why they're attracted. And there are two main clusters of these deposits, one in Southeast China, where it's debatable whether or not these deposits are through Carlin or some variations thereof. And uh, Southwest US here is the other big place. And there have been in the last 10 years, uh, some discoveries in Yukon as well of clearly Carlin type deposits for me. But really the action is in the Great Basin in the US, which hosts about 80% of the Carlin gold. And this is where you have the largest Carlin deposits, and especially in North Central Nevada, which is a map of our friendly Nevada here. And, and basically uh, all the yellow dots here are Carlin type deposits. And this area of about 200 kilometers by 300 uh, hosts uh, over 250 million ounces of Carlin gold. So this is quite impressive. It would be on par with the, in, in, in the uh, Eastern Goldfields province in WA, this would be on par with the gold content and same area as Norseman to Iluna, basically. Not, not to Iluna, but to Kalgoorlie. So that's the scale we're talking about. Or on par with Southern Abitibi, which is another place with 250 plus million ounces of gold. And this area here is a big production center with four and a half million ounces of gold a year and that roughly represents 5% of the total gold production in the real world. So it's significant. And the gold deposits are distributed, and I'll come back to this later, along these linear trends, which represent deep basement cracks, actually. So th this, this is why companies are quite interested in Carlin deposits in Nevada and look for them elsewhere, is they are big and overall pretty high grade. Right, and then just a gold strike, which we'll talk about a little bit more, 
uh, endowment of over, around 60 million ounces of gold at seven-ish grams per ton. And the S, that system has produced uh, 50 million ounces of gold so far. So this is, would be on par with the Golden Mile Femiston system. Right? And you could see a lot of the big, big deposits with, with uh, many of them plus 10 million ounces, decent grades. And that's why they're attractive as a target. And they are quite distinct. Um, my first job after 12 years at the Canadian Survey, working in greenstone belts on deformed terrains, was to go and look at these deposits and help with the geology in Nevada. You look at these rocks and you see nothing, basically. Uh, what what the, 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 these, the ore, uh, I can describe it as a siliceous replacement of some limey rocks, limestone, or replacement of breccias. And But the gold is, is hosted in microscopic uh, are seen in pyrite grains, so you don't really see them. And this is a typical you know, 25 grams per ton high grade sample from one of the deposits. You can see the laminated um, silty limestone. It is silicified, but you don't see anything else, 25 grams per ton. And here's another example from it's a breccia this time, silicified, but who would guess that this contains over 100 grams per ton of gold? So this is one of the distinctive features of these, this mineralization. It used to be called invisible gold deposits or micron gold deposits for that reason. And because of that, the ores are refractory. So that, that's a, um, you need the grade to be able to process those ores, but that seems to work well. And really to see where the gold is, you need to uh, zoom in uh, at high magnification. And these are the, pyrite grains that holds the gold, that's a scale five microns. So these are you know, 10, 20 microns across, very small. You can't really see that with your naked eye. And people that have studied these deposits, they, they distinguish a main ore stage, which is the main mineralization event, and the late ore stage, which I'll show you what this looks like. But basically the main ore stage consists of uh, overgrowth, of arsenical arsenian pyrite on top of pre ore pyrite. Typically, that would be diagenetic pyrite, very small grains, in these uh, dirty limestone, as we call them. And, and the gold itself, shown here, forms specific rims at different stages of growth of these arsenian rims. So, this is where the gold is. And that's what makes these seven, eight, 10 gram plus ores in the samples that I've shown you. And here on the right is a slide that uh, uh, Gene Klein lent me many years ago. Uh, you could see these pre or pyrite cores with the lighter colored Arsenian pyrite rims. And when you uh, do spot analyses on these rims, uh, there are two represented here, uh, you get hundreds to thousands of PPM gold in here as well as multiple percent arsenic. This is what Carlin ore looks like. And here you have the ore pimint uh, surrounding, you know, filling the space between these pyrite grains and replacing the rock. And this typically what you have there would be realgar ore pimint, in this case, stibnite, has fracture fillings and matrix fillings as well. And this is what to me characterizes carbon ore. But this is well known, well documented. And let's change scale and look at the deposit. And this cartoon here, which, which was made several years ago, represents the key elements uh, of these carbon type deposits. We are sitting in a sequence of mixed silty limestone. I might use the word dirty limestone uh, down the road. Uh, these are the reactive rocks and you'll have uh, more silty layers or non-reactive rocks that could be dolomite as well, that are not so reactive. And in any default, these are structurally controlled carbonate replacement deposits. So here's a fault zone, um, and that's a conduit for fluid, which reacts with the calcareous uh, carbonate host rocks. And basically you have an outboard uh, front of decalcification in orange, so you basically dissolve the calcite component of the rock. You're left with the uh, detrital uh, silicate, silicate residue that maintains the porosity. 
So that's the most outboard reaction you recognize in these rocks, alteration front, sorry. And then there's an the in, inner front of silicification, weak to very strong massive silica in the most intense part of these ore bodies. And breccias are a key component, key element of carlin deposits as well. Uh, you can have fault breccias, cataclysite um, that are good for mineralization or dissolution breccias. When you dissolve all the calcite in these rocks, you create space and the rocks collapses, producing dissolution and collapsed breccias. And the goal basically is in the conduit and expands outside, sometimes outside the silica front, uh, but never outboard of the decalcification front, obviously. But this is the typical uh, geometry architecture of a Carlin deposit. Big deposits have many feeding structures, so everything is coalesced, everything has been silicified or decalcified over wide areas. And here's an example from the Bald Mountain district uh, in a old pit of a small deposit showing uh, what's represented in this cartoon. So you've got a bunch of geos here for scale. There's a fault that's striking obliquely across the face in the different benches. And these are silicified reactive carbonate host rocks. This one a bit less reactive. So the dark color here is silicified rock going outboard to decalcify. And this is what, in a a uh, small example, this is what is the, the anatomy, if you like, of the Carlin system. At least the way I understand them in my head. There might be people on this, in the audience that understand, understand them better than I do. And that's fair enough. Uh, so, let, let's, so this is what they are. Let's now look where they occur at their setting. And <clears throat> I'll highlight some points that are important. Uh, controls, I guess for the Carlin system. So this is the Western US, the Great Basin. Basically the, the host rocks are um, a passive margin sequence deposited on the old Proterozoic North American craton. And they straddle the rifted edge of the craton. So this, this line here is the interpreted edge of the North American craton. With intact continental basement here, thinned segment of the craton here, and, in, and out here you're in the oceanic basement. So this is the rifted edge. And basically the, the passive margin has a platform facies sequence here, a slope facies transition. We have um, these dirty carbonates are dominant in this and the slope here. And this is the mainly siliciclastic rocks, cherts, mudstone, argillites deposited in a deeper basin. And these are the best rocks for Carlin systems. And this, indeed, this is where they occur along the trends that I was referring to. So the best host rocks lie in here. And there, the evolution of this area, the tectonic evolution is quite complex. And it had in the late Paleozoic to Mesozoic multiple orogenic events, contraction events. One of the very important ones is the anthrorogeny. What it did, uh, it put these non-reactive siliciclastic rocks here on top of your slow facies rocks, non-reactive rock as a cap on favorable rock, just above the Roberts Mountain Trust. So the trust sheet is now, just above these rocks here, is now made up of these rocks above the Roberts Mountain Trust which I'll refer to uh, multiple times. So this is, uh, it happened around 350 million years ago, plus or minus, um, it's not a snapshot event. And the other important um, orogenic event is younger is the Laramide orogeny, around 70 million year to 45, 50. And why this is important is that it, it, the subduction zone went flat underneath this. So you had flat subduction, that extended inland all the way to here. Okay, so, and, and that becomes important when the, there's a shift in tectonic plate motions and that Farallon plate, Farallon plate as it's called, starts to sink. And that changes the uh, tectonic regime. We'll come back to that later in here. And at the end of the Lermite orogeny, 
when subduction flat subduction stops, that slab kind of sinks, and there's, there's a shift from contraction compression to extension, starting sometime in the Paleocene, Neocene, uh, causing normal faulting or normal reactivation of faults, culminating in the later basement range uh, extension, which produced this kind of topography. And the Carlin systems form in that 35 to 42 million year time period, roughly around the time of the onset of that extension, concentrated in the dirty carbonate rocks of the slope facies and along reactivated basement structures. I'll emphasize that again. But this is a, a really good setup for Carlin systems. And the next slide is a stratigraphic cross section through here, giving you a sense of what these different uh, facies are and where the Carlin systems occur in them. And this is from the work of uh, Harry Cook uh, that's been well utilized in Nevada. So this is a platform and the platform edge, you know, changed position through time, but it roughly sits in here, grading west into slope facies rocks. So you have debris flows, turbidites, uh, depositing from that edge and sliding down, and the basin, which is filled, um, basin fishes with chert, on stones, and all these silicy plastic rocks. The yellow bars represent the position of the Carlin systems in this environment. And the biggest uh, districts, the North Carlin district and the Cortez district, uh, <clears throat> sit in the rocks that are proximal to the edge of the platform. And the host rocks, at that, the rocks that host these deposits are formed at a time of uh, what's called third order low stand. So lower, low water levels globally. And because the water level is low, it promotes karsting in the carbonates here in blue, but also a lot of instability along the platform margin. So you get these debris flows, turbidites, slump, and all this stuff. And this is really favorable for Carlin mineralization. And what we'll do now is, is focus on the Carlin trend, essentially. Depending on time, I might uh, have two slides on the Cortez district for comparison, but we'll use the North Carlin trend as our representative example of the architecture of some of these districts. We'll zoom in later, but basically the map here shows this part of the Carlin trend. That's the productive part, and that's the part that's in the uh, favorable uh, dirty carbonate rocks. Basically what you're looking at here is silicy plastic rocks that form the upper plate to the Roberts Mountain Trust. So these are the basin rocks that have been transported 100 and some kilometers to the east and dumped on top of or, or structurally and placed above the favorable carbonate rocks that are shown in blue in all this series of slides. Upper plate silicy clastic non-reactive rocks in green and the blues and the purples will be uh, the favorable host rocks below that Roberts Mountain Trust. So these trends are an alignment of structural windows of these favorable rocks, typically broad, you know, open. I forgot to mention that this, this whole area is a, basically is affected by fold and truss belt, but open folds, low angle truss, and, and overall the, 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 the stratigraphy, the, str the strata are shallow dipping to flat line. Forgot to mention that, sorry. So what you have is a trail of structural windows of your favorable rocks at surface. Um, it's also a trail of intrusions, Jurassic stocks here, you have Cretaceous stocks, and a whole series of dikes of Jurassic, Cretaceous, and Tertiary age, which are not shown here, but I'll show in a later map. And that trend has been sliced and diced by high angle normal faults shown here by these black lines. Some of them are pre-mineral old faults that have been reactivated at the time of mineralization and also during the later basin and range fault. 
and there's uh, up to kilometer offset, uh, normal offset on some of these faults. So these are really deep alluvial basins. All the white stuff is um, post mineral carlin, gravels, and volcanics, and alluvial deposits. The other point here is that the deposits have a large footprint. Look at the scale here, five kilometers. This is the surface projection of what I think is the one gram footprint of these systems. And look at the scale, a few kilometers by two kilometer wide here in this case. And the system are distributed, the big deposits along uh, these high angle normal faults, north trending ones and northwest trending. The Castle Reef Fault here controls these deposits. The post fault system controls deposits over 10 kilometer strike length and other faults here and so on. And, and so these are the feeder faults for sure. And they, uh, the master feeder fault, I should say. And mineralization is uh, 38, 41 millimeters, dated by a syn mineral, mercury mineral called galkeite, and also dated from pre and post mineral Eocene dikes of basically the same age. That's pretty well constrained here. <clears throat> Sorry. The next slide will just zoom into this, this area more specifically. Oh, sorry, we'll look at the strat column first, just to have an idea of how the rocks are organized. And that's a representative strat column through the middle of the map that I've shown you. It would also be similar mostly to what you would see in the Cortez district. Roberts Mountain Trust, that have taken these basin facies, silicate plastic rocks, transported them 100 and some kilometers eastward on top of your host sequence. Um, from top to, to bottom, you have uh, calcareous siltstone and sandstone. I'll spare you the names, you can read them, but I'll try to avoid these stratigraphic names because it gets confusing. So, so <clears throat> calcareous siltstone and sandstone sitting above your carbonate host rocks that are various combination of lime, mudstone, uh, micritic siltstone, uh, and silty micrites. These are all the, these units here. And uh, in the Carlin trend, I'll show you where it is on the map later, have this, the edge of the platform represented by this bootstrap, massive to oolitic limestone from which are shedding a series of debris flows, as I alluded to. So this is the edge of the platform with a series of debris flows shedding from it, getting thinner away from that edge. They're, they're schematic here. And the gold stratigraphic distribution of gold mineralization in that trend, in that part of the world, covers all these rocks here. So the, and then the most reactive rocks, the best hosts, are these micritic silty micrites <clears throat> that are called planar laminated. I might use the name, this unit here, and that one, wispy laminated, which is basically bioturbated. Uh, Micrite. And you have these debris flows. This is a fresh sample away from that edge. So you've got a thin fossil hash bed. But those are, are a lot more reactive to carlin fluids. And here's a thicker debris flow. You could see coral fragments and various uh, spicules and things like that. So this is one of these thicker debris flow. And that is really a good host for gold as well. All of this stuff, these debris flows, uh, you got mudstone, uh, limestone turbidites as well. You got slump features. All this enhances the permeability and porosity of the rock. And that's why I think they're good hosts. Let's look at the map. Just quickly, some key features uh, of the trend before I show you the deposits. This is the central Jurassic coal strike intrusive complex. I've shown you this before. Upper plate rocks, the Roberts Mountain Trust, here and here, upper plate, and below the Roberts Mountain Cross are these calcareous siltstones and the various limestones in blues and purple here that are the good hosts. And of course, these different faults that are uh, defining coherent fault blocks. And this is best looked at uh, with this structural contour map here. It's a structural contour map of the base 
of this contact here, which is reliable. Everybody agrees on it. And basically what it shows is big fault blocks with a that are plunging for the most part shallowly to the north, anticlinal structure or, or you know, and dipping north. And this is what um, the architecture of the Carlin trend is bounded by faults that were active at Jurassic times, some of them active at mineralization time, like the post fault system is an ore controlling structure, but also reactivated subsequently. And, and this fault here, that's this, the post fault system, it's got different names, but that's what I call it, extends for about 10 kilometers with offsets of thousands of feet or up to, I can't remember exactly, but close to a kilometer offset, total normal offset in there. Another important point here, I referred to dikes before. So these pink lines are a swarm of Jurassic Lamprophere dikes, same age as the Gold Strike stock. So you got a magma coming up here. Uh, this is crustally derived magma, and you have mantle derived magma. Uh, represented by this dike swarm here, which means you have uh, a deep stepping structure here. At Jurassic time, there was connection with the mantle, with the upper mantle to have these lamprophere. So this reflects a deep basement structure underneath the Carlin trend, even though you don't have a through-going fault mapped at surface. And there are also these uh, Eocene dikes, pre sin to post-mineral dikes that are trending this way and also intruding along uh, some strands of the pulse fault. That's the key elements of the geology. There's one more piece I need to highlight, which is the edge of that platform, uh, carbonate platform. So this is the bootstrap, south, the western edge, the bootstrap limestone that I referred to before, from which our shedding over a certain stratigraphic interval, these debris flows, these um, with, with fossil hash beds, carbonate, uh, line, uh, brief debris. And the extent of the debris flows as we know them in the Carlin trends is about you know, three, four kilometers away from the uh, map edge of this uh, shelf or reef, depending on what you want to call it. Okay. This edge of the platform in this area is oblique to the overall Carlin trend. So we're looking at an intersection of a inherited Paleozoic feature with a trend that was certainly a deep crack at Jurassic times and at a place where you have emplacement of these mid-crustal magmas represented by the gold strike intrusive complex. And this is where your gold deposits are. The biggest gold deposits sit at this conjunction here. This is again, is the just one last point on this. this is the, you can see here that the post fault system is controlling mineralization over 10 kilometers. And I think of these deposits as, you know, big hydrothermal cells. And this would be the gold strike system, at least to this extent here. The other side of the gold strike, the pre-mineral Jurassic stock is located here. It's called the Genesis B system, similar size. The Leeville system, again, you're looking at four kilometers strike length by you know, one, two kilometers naturally. So they're huge, huge systems. And you can see um, two more points, sorry. And the mineralization appears to be confined to this corridor between the edge of the bootstrap limestone, platform edge, and the extent of debris flows that host most of the mineralization in this area. But mineralization also extends in the bootstrap limestone, which is all this area here. Okay, It has a slightly different character, and I'll show you that. <coughs> So this is the, the, the architecture. So the key thing is that you have the right rocks, you're close to the um, shelf edge. We have more debris flows, more perturbations in your rock, more permeability, porosity. You are around a Jurassic intrusion, which acted as a structural buttress 
for subsequent orogenic events. So that enhanced the structural, the fracturing and structural permeability around these intrusions, which is good for fluid ingress. And, it, and, and you have on top of this, you have a cap of um, non-reactive, non-leaky siliciclastic rocks. So you have a cap above all of this, which promotes lateral dispersion of the fluids away from some of these um, conduit faults. So that's what enhances the, in my, view, my view, the lateral extent of the footprints of these systems. So right here, you're at the conjunction of a lot of uh, favorable structural and lithologic features. And you could say from that point of view, it's kind of a perfect local storm for forming big deposits. And no surprise that this year contains 60 million ounces of gold. So let's look at these, uh, just, yeah, well, before we look at the rocks, some examples, uh, we'll look at the map of the gold strike pit here, key aspects of the geology and a cross section. That's the outline of the gold strike pit, a detailed map that the geologists there have maintained over the years and a cross section through the middle of it, right here, it's a cross section. Uh, this is the Roberts Mountain Trust here. So above all of this stuff are these flat-lying non-reactive silicy classic rocks, which form kind of a seal or a cap. And this is the, the calcareous siltstone and sandstone at the top of your carbonate sequence or lower plate sequence and your different uh, series of lime mud and mudstones, calcareous mudstones and silty micrites. <clears throat> the ar architecture of this is dominated by a, um, a, the Betsy anticline, a, a east, north, northwest to west trending anticline, overprinted by these north trending, uh, north Betsy and post anticlines. Post anticline is one of the key controls of mineralization in this deposit. Here's the gold strike stock, and it's uh, it's more of a sill. We've got all these little tongues and, and silly bits that are extending away from the main stock itself. Gazillion faults, a whole series of faults of a northwest trending set filled by Lermperfier dikes, many of them, or uh, monzonite dikes as well in Jurassic age. So these are old faults or pre or sin Jurassic faults. We've got sets that are trending north, northeast, also filled with these dikes. So the fault architecture is, here is quite old um, and serve as a, a pretty broad plumbing system for the deposit. And, and the key thing on this long section here, this cross section, sorry, it shows the distribution of the gold. Red is seven grams per ton, orange is two. You can really see that the mineralization is preferentially occurs a whole over a whole range of units, but dominated by uh, mineralization in the wispy laminated and planar laminated whole rocks. So these were the most favorable rocks shown on the strat column before. It's those guys here. These are the best hosts, and let's do these two shades of blue here. This is the post fault system. That is both a feeder and an offset to the deposit. So there's a, along this trend here, there's upper plate rocks on the other side. So you went from, you go from lower plate to upper plate rocks, and then into carlin gravels and alluvium on the outer strand of the post fault. The complex fault system, complex history. And that's where it is on this long section. So what I, Propose now is, is I'm a geologist. I like I'm a visual type, so I'll show you pictures of some of these rocks, fresh to altered to mineralized, what it looks like, and then we'll wrap up. I'm seeing this piece of core, so this is a, a silty micrite, calcareous uh, uh, limestone. Sorry, <clears throat> we've seen before. When it gets uh, decalcified, you dissolve all the carbonate in that rock, and you end up with a rubble like this. This is completely decalcified rock. It's a bit oxidized. There is oxidation um, at, uh, near surface in, in these systems in, in Nevada. And this is what it looks like, just a decalcification slash collapse breccia. 
It's an example here where it's uh, weakly salicified, decalcified, and it's 42 grams per ton gold. And you look at this rock and you wouldn't know because of the microscopic refers sulfide grains in there. But the rock can be, as you get closer or stronger in intensity of alteration mineralization, then you have a really intense silicification. And these are uh, from the upper mud unit. You can, see, you can still see the bedding, in this case, preserved in these rocks. And this is really strongly silicified. And again, 20 grams per ton gold. And from the, <coughs> the highest part, the, the, the richest part of the system, the deep post system, just foot wall to the post fault, is the planar or wispy laminated. It's hard to say here, but you have a front between the calcified, the reaction front, the alteration front between the calcified limestone and silicified limestone, which is darker here. All of this is mineralized plus one ounce per ton material. And the orange bit you see here is this late four stage realgar, uh, sometimes orpiment that's filling crack fractures and invading the rocks. So, so this is the, the end product, if you like, of alteration mineralization, the prograde silica silicification, decalcification, and retrograde. Realgar or pigment stibnite in places here. And all the rocks gets mineralized. So this is a cataclasite along one of the strands of the post fault in, in the deep star deposit. And all this black material here filling fractures and, and, and matrix of this cataclasite, replacing fractures and matrix in this cataclasite, this silica sulfide and it's mineralized. And this is ore grade material. And you have monzonite, Jurassic monzonite dikes. Uh, as well, they get caught up in this dissolution breccia, <coughs> the dissolution process, and the dikes crack. You have crackled breccia uh, develop on the edges of these dikes as a result of this. And all this black material, again, here is silica sulfide, is, is, is mineralized material. This is not more grade because you don't have enough of it, but, but this is another manifestation of mineralization. And I've emphasized the, the debris flows as being place a good place, you know, they're particularly reactive to mineralization. And at one location down the gold strike pit, um, it's where these, these samples come from. Uh, here's the, the fresh, freshest bit of the debris flow, fossiliferous debris flow that I could find. Here's a uh, partly decalcified example of it. And you could see the fragmental nature is still preserved. And if you, if you lift that rock as light, it's lost, it's lost a lot of its material. And then that gets further dissolved, or the carbonates further dissolved and silicified with silica and arsenium pyrite, which gives it the black color. And this is ounce per ton material here. And in places along the same debris flow, you get silica sulfide material and overprinting uh, realgar as a late ore stage. So this is a whole suite from fresh to incipient alteration, alteration mineralization, to mineralization and, and late ore stage phase into it. And if you go in the massive to oolitic limestone, this bootstrap limestone, well, in, you know, across the edge, sorry, so if you go and deposits that are within this limestone, within the platform, this is what it looks like. Uh, there's a lot of pre-mineral cavity fill breccia. Remember I said uh, these were, these carbonates were, went through a time of low, uh, third order low stand, so of potential karst development. And these are uh, cavity fill breccias, you know, one big cavity leaking down to a lower cavity. This is all pre-ore in places that does get mineralized. And there's additional brecciation that's related to the mineralization process as well. But typically what you see is silicification of these breccias, uh, sort of pale to gray color. This is only silica replacing matrix and clasts and breccia. 
This is later calcite infill that is post mineral, this white stuff. We go from silica only breccia to silica pyrite breccia. Here's the front between silica, silica pyrite, but this is not or weakly mineralized. Then you grade into silica sulfide mineralized breccia. And this is an example from Nico. So here's a dike. I've shown you a crackle example. That's a Jurassic Monzonite dike. And you get a, a, a rain, a, a breccia develop underneath it um, with diminishing, you know, increasing matrix proportion. And the matrix to that breccia here has been totally replaced by silica sulfide. This material runs um, up to 20 ounces per ton material. This very, very high grade. So this is what mineralization looked like in these massive limestone, just silicification and dissolution. So those rocks were, were quite dissolutioned at the end of all of this stuff. Jessica, do I have time for two slides on, on Cortez? Or when you press for time? Good, okay, thanks. So let's move to the Cortez district, just for comparison quickly. Uh, we were looking at this part of the Carlin trend here. Now we're looking at the Cortez district along what is known as the Battle Mountain Eureka. Remember Eureka, you can't kiss a woman with a mustache down there. Well, Eureka is down here somewhere, one of those small places. Uh, the Cortez district um, is here. And basically same color code more or less as before. The trend striking like this, and you have these structural windows of favorable carbonate post rocks through the cover of siliciclastic rocks that were transported above the Roberts Mountain Trust, which is shown here. Right? There is a Eocene post mineral volcanic cover in this tan color, as well as alluvial cover in deep valleys again. So that trend, like we saw before, has been sliced up by a series of long-lived pre-mineral faults, but reactivated during basin and range and uh, basin and range faults themselves. So slice and dice, and a lot of uh, fault block movement here. The other characteristic is these Jurassic intrusions. This is the Mill Canyon stock, similar to Gold Strike stock in the Carlin trend, same age. Also a sill shape, which I didn't emphasize a lot in the Carlin trend, but there are silly intrusions. Uh, you have younger intrusions as well here. So this one is Eocene at Robertson, but, but it's a corridor of intrusive rocks as well. And here are three in the strand tree deposits uh, greater than 10 million ounces. So that's Pipeline, Cortez Hills, and the latest one that's discovered is the Gold Rush four mile system. So it'll end up being above 10 million ounces. <clears throat> Mineralization here has been dated at around 35 ME, slightly younger than in the carbon trend. And that is significant as you'll see later. The next slide is just a surface map of this area here and a cross section and long section through the gold rush system as an example of slightly different morphology and control on mineralization. So if we focus on the left here, this is a the surface projection of plus five gram mineralization along the gold rush four mile trend. Mineralization continues all the way up to about here now. You see the upper plate rocks above the Roberts Mountain Trust under which are exposed these uh, calcareous siltstones and sandstones, or their equivalent down here. But the rest is covered with alluvium and Cenozoic post-mineral basalts, and post-mineral intrusions as well. And let's focus on a cross section through here. So this is the, gives you an idea of the gentle open folded nature of the units here. All the blues are carbonate post rocks. The two sh shades of brown are equivalent to these uh, calcareous siltstone and sandstone that were also present in the Carlin trend. They're given different names here, but they're similar age, sim 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 similar look. 
And basically the key units here is what is called the one band five unit. It's a, again, a silty micrite with possibly debris flows with, with pressure units around them. And this is the best host to mineralization, the top of that unit. And mineralization is hosted in this anticlinal open anticline here. And mineralization follows a trace of that anticline, at least partly. And another control, this is an oldish diagram. Another control is these low angle thrusts, uh, probably responsible for the asymmetric folds that you see here, asymmetric anticline, but also as feeder zone. So that's another control of mineralization. If you look at a long section, it gives you a sense of continuity for almost seven kilometers, five grams per ton, and the yellow is the silicification that, that accompanies this. So nearly continuous mineralization at the top of this pale blue one band five units, all the way to, to the, the tip of the four mile area. And I look at this and I think of this as a snake or an old Carlin River when it formed, so paleo aquifer. So a lot of fluids have gone through here following this very specific stratigraphic unit. And mineralization here, uh, in the, the gold rush system, uh, you have passive replacement of the rocks, preserving the, the texture of the rock, where you see nothing. This, one, this was one of the Carlin samples I've shown you at the beginning. And there's a, a breccia unit, um, dissolution breccia, possibly after a debris flow, uh, that is silicified and mineralized. And this is what it looks like, very much like some material in the Carlin trend. And this is again, ounce per ton material. So if you compare this stuff, the Carlin trend is about 100 kilometers west, uh, east, sorry, of the Gold Rush, uh, the Cortez district. And compare this rock in the Carlin trend to this one. In a very similar process, uh, similar end product in terms of mineralization, but different deposit morphology. So in Carlin Trend, the, the footprint is more stubby, and here it's linear and then controlled by simpler features. Good. <coughs> so um, there's one important part of the Carlin system that makes the whole place and makes them unique is the tectonic setting at the time of their formation. So you're, you've seen 34 to 42 MA, and that's a time where there's a big shift, tectonic shift in the area. Up to about say 50 million years, you had flat subduction of the Farallon plate all the way for inland for a thousand kilometers. And there was a shift in the plate motion going strike slip, and that's when the San Andreas Fault developed on the west coast of the US. So no longer subduction here and the ferrium slab either delaminated, rolled back, or sank. And that <clears throat> created a um, upwelling of the asthenosphere. It's the interpretation that people make of that. Upwelling of asthenosphere and that the high heat flow and heating of the crust over a wide area. And it also triggered a lot of magmatism at that time. Um, and that actually uh, swept across Nevada from roughly the Northwest, Northeast to the Southwest. And people have uh, actually tracked the magmatic front at different times. So 40 MA, the interpreted magmatic front in this little part of the Farion, above the Farion plate, magmatic sweep is front this year at 40 MA. 36 MA and 25 MA. And basically the age of the Carlin systems here in the uh, uh, Jarrett Canyon district, 39 to 42, Carlin trend between these two um, ages, uh, 37, 38 in between, the Cortez district at 36 MA. So basically the Carlin systems, uh, young to the Southwest, mimicking the um, advance of the magmatic front. So basically one way to look at this is the, as the slab rolled back, the heat wave made its way all migrated Southwest 
And that high heat flow triggers a lot of circulation of fluids, a lot of magnetism as well coming up. And then these, at this time, all these trends, which are old structures, would be dilated. In dilatant orientation with respect to that sinking slab and that extension. And they become the perfect conduit for gold with a lot of heat at the right time. That explains also why you have um, co-spatial, co-temporal dikes, Eocene dikes and mineralization in those trends. So they're both product of the same tectonic process, basically. Not sure if that was clear, but that represents a pretty um, special setting here. I've seen Carlin systems in Yukon. They have the same characteristics that I've shown you here. I've seen a very small example in Spain of all places that has all these characteristics. One in Kyrgyzstan, but none of those places match the uh, tectonic history at the time of mineralization. And maybe that's why uh, Nevada is so unique in terms of size and gold budget in carbon systems. So just in closing, um, basically carbon systems uh, are globally rare, but they obviously are an attractive target. If you've got a good one, it's got a lot of grade continuous mineralization. Uh, they have well-known characteristics and control, so you know what to look for if you explore for them. And the best deposits or districts are the confluence of um, slope facies rocks close to the platform margins, for re reasons I've explained, uh, are controlled by reactivated old basement structures, both as a magma conduit and fluid conduit. And the other key element here is that you've transported non-reactive rock above your favorable host sequence, providing a cap, promoting lateral fluid dispersion at deposit to district scale. <laughs> and, and mostly uh, they form in Nevada at a unique time and tectonic setting, which promoted dilation of deep cracks, high heat flow, widespread magnetism, and promoting fluid circulation and formation of these big deposits. And, and just one point too I find interesting is the Bingham Canyon, most people here, most of you guys would know as a big porphyry copper gold system, uh, super giant in Utah. It's the same age as gold strike. So it's also a product of the same process at the same time, same large scale tectonic process. <clears throat> so Nevada, obviously just, I wanted to show you this slide. Um, it's maturing. It's seen a lot of exploration effort. A lot of exploration continues. And despite this, you know, the companies continue to make discoveries deeper and deeper. And the latest, mainly brownfields, fair enough. Uh, but you can see starting in the 1980s, uh, deposits were found at increasing depth. And down to over 600 meters depth was the discovery hole at four mile, which is the extension Northern extension of the Gold Rush system. And that's because, and these are basically geological discoveries, uh, knowing the stratigraphy, knowing the alteration vectoring in. And this is what leads to these deep discoveries in districts that are well understood. And it's a good application, geological application of a lot of the deposit scale controls I've highlighted here. And this is what I had to say about Carlin Systems in Nevada. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. I really appreciate you talking to us about that.